Welcome students to Lady Lazarus by Sylvia Plath. So the title of Lazarus is a reference to the biblical story in the narrative of John and it's about uh, a man who died who's brought back from the dead to the living. But this is the title Lady Lazarus, so think about the connotations of that. I have done it again one year in every ten, I manage it, a sort of walking miracle, my skin bright as a Nazi lampshade. Now notice the image of the lampshade here, which is a horrific image of wartime atrocities that were committed by the Nazis against the Jews. Um, and this, is, this poem is full of these shocking images, and that links, of course, to the... Um, the desire to shock as a new generation of poets and writers of the post-war era. And I have done it again one year in every ten. Uh, well, that's a autobiographical, although it's not entirely accurate, uh, but it's relating to Plath's near-death experiences. When she was a child, she was involved in, a, in an accident uh, in the car, um, around about the age of 10, and then when she was 19, she had her first suicide attempt, uh, burying herself in the cellar of her home and being found after three days um, by her brother. And uh, so this is an idea of being brought out of a tomb which connects to the title Lazarus. And... Um, We'll move on. A paperweight, my face a featureless fine Jew linen. Peel off the napkin, oh my enemy, do I terrify? Now these very short lines in these two in these tercets um, make the words really stand out. A paperweight is something rather trivial that you have on your desk, and it's juxtaposed with this um, idea of of, of, of uh, the atrocities again of, of the Holocaust and this linen uh, referring to a shroud, a death shroud uh, peel off the napkin she says which again is an inappropriate image there of, of, to do with meal times and then an apostrophe oh my enemy uh, addressing someone directly as an enemy uh, Followed by the 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 vowel, open vowel sound of terrify and the suspense there with the two dashes. The nose, the eye pits, the full set of teeth, the sour breath will vanish in a day. It, there's a, there's this ironic tone uh, where she's being flippant almost about the image that she she's presenting of um, well. A dead body essentially um, with with all the body parts being brought to the fore and then soon soon the flesh the grave cave eight will be at home on me so she's talking about a, a regeneration here because uh, the grave cave eight those that assonance there uh, draws our attention to the decomposition of the body but she says soon soon the flesh will be at home on me so uh, as though she's going to put on the body once again and come back from the dead. And I, a smiling woman, I am only thirty, and like the cat I have nine times to die. There's a vengeful tone coming in here. You thought I was dead, but I'm coming back as a smiling woman. Um, and this image of the cat uh, with its nine lives is a sort of... Uh, jokey uh, sarcasm there. This is number three, she says. What a trash to annihilate each decade. Notice the use of colloquial language. What a trash. Um, uh, making it very immediate and accessible. And of course she's referring to her own um, suicidal tendencies, her own struggle with um, the fascination for taking her own life. What a million filaments, 
The peanut crunching crowd shoves in to see them unwrap me, hand and foot, the big strip tease, gentlemen, ladies. So again, Plath is um, now drawing our attention to this idea of the light bulb, the million filaments, as though the lights have come on in the cinema and there's a peanut crunching crowd. It's this voyeurism, this fascination with her um, her suicide attempts. Uh, and and she's exposed as in a big strip tease, but it's not a titillating exposure, this. And the irony is even deepened further by the fact that this is about death, not about sex. So we've got Eros and Thanatos being mixed in here. Um, the drives, the human drives for um, life and death. And this gentleman, ladies, is interesting. It's an inversion of the usual address, which puts the men uh, in the forefront of the voyeurism. These are my hands, my knees. I may be skin and bone. Nevertheless, I am the same identical woman. The first time it happened, I was ten. It was an accident. So she's, you know, exposing her own hands and knees, this skin and bone. Uh, but she's saying that she's now resurrected and she's the same in spite of her experience. And then she goes back over those um, close encounters with death. The second time I meant to last it out and not come back at all, I rocked shut as a seashell. So this is reference to her um, suicide attempt in the cellar at her house. They had to call and call and pick the worms off me like sticky pearls. Now these images of the seashell and the sticky pearls are interesting because of course the title of the collection is Ariel, which is a reference to Shakespeare's The Tempest. And these uh, sticky pearls refers to a song by um, the the sprite, the fairy Ariel, who um, sings a song about a drowned father whose um, eyes have turned to pearls. So um, again, references to Shakespeare and to mortality and, and drowning and death. Dying is an art like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say I've a call. Uh, the word dying is, is all alone in, in this 15th stanza. And it's the suspense there that with the enjambment is an art uh, which creates the irony there. Um, of course, it's not an art. Um, and and uh, she's really um, being ironic with the I do it exceptionally well because she has failed in her attempts, of course, to leave this life. But uh, the uh, anaphora in I do it, I do it, I do it, um, it creates this insistence, this emphasis, which is unbearably uh, deliberating. I guess you could say I have a call, as though it's some kind of calling. Uh, to Well, one would expect to find that with a vocation such as um, being a doctor or, or being a, a poet or something like that, something positive. But here she's talking about death. It's easy yeah. enough to do it in a cell. It's easy enough to do it and stay put. It's the theatrical comeback in broad day to the same place, the same face, the same boot and mouth shout. A miracle that knocks me out. So she's, again, this sarcastic tone, this bitterness that she feels about people's reactions to uh, her not dying that, um, that she's, she's conveying here. For the eyeing of my scars there is a charge the hearing of my heart it really goes again she's resenting here the attention that she's given uh, to her scars which are of course not her physical scars necessarily um, but to those psychological wounds 
and the repetition, the epistrophe there of charge, charge, um, reminds us also of a, an electrical charge, which uh, brings us to um, the contextual uh, knowledge that Sylvia Plath underwent electroshock therapy as part of a treatment for her depression and mental illness. And there is a charge, a very large charge, for a word or a touch or a bit of blood or a piece of my hair or my clothes. So, in other words, she's putting herself in the position of being um, scavenged upon, if you like, people coming to take parts of her in a, in a bloodthirsty and uh, gory manner. So, so, Herr Doktor, so, Herr Enemy. And now she brings in the German language, which was the language of her father, and which, of course, in the post-war era, is associated with wartime and with the atrocities of the Nazis again. I am your opus, I am your valuable, the pure gold baby that melts to a shriek. I turn and burn, do not think I underestimate your great concern. So she's playing with the vowel sounds here. Your opus is your great work of art. She's addressing here the... Um, the uh, perpetrators of the atrocities of the war, and she's relating herself to be uh, a victim in the Holocaust when she's describing melting to a shriek, turning and burning. The image she is creating in our minds is one of uh, the gas chambers or the, um, the places where uh, people were exterminated. And the irony of the line, do not think I underestimate your great concern, um, echoes the turn and burn of her annihilation in, in, a, in a bitter irony. Ash, ash, you poke and stir, flesh, bone, there is nothing there, a cake of soap, a wedding ring, a gold filling. And she continues this evocation of these, um, this incineration of bodies in the war and the uh, sibilances there in ash, ash, which um, is also like a hushed sound, the hushed awe that we have, um, the horror of the images she's creating. The cake of soap, the wedding ring and the gold filling all evoke um, what, was, what remained of the Holocaust victims after the Nazis had dealt with them. Herr God, Herr Lucifer, beware, beware, out of the ash I rise with my red hair, and I eat men like air. So this um, assonance in air, with beware, hair, and air, leaves a sort of open sound at the end, um, reflecting perhaps the rising of this phoenix-like figure, um, which is also a witch-like figure. Um, the red hair, uh, perhaps, you know, a sort of um, a hellish uh, flame uh, rising, and uh, this flame is turned against the men this time, um, and the hair god and hair Lucifer is putting the devil and God in the same line, so any authority figure there, or any figure of fear, is put together uh, as, a, as the enemy um, and the uh, figure of vengeance, the fury returning, is um, a warning that they will be consumed by her. So just to give a bit more context, these are the actual uh, newspaper cuttings that record the event when Sylvia Plath at the age of 20, um, attempted suicide and went missing for three days. So this idea of being in the tomb for three days, like Lazarus was in the Bible, and, uh, and Sylvia Plath's return from her suicide attempt is clear. 
and you can pause the video here to just make a note of some of the aspects of the poem and remember to make a note of the context of the 50s and 60s, the post-war era, the shadow of the war and uh, this uh, violence and holocaust imagery and the impact that that creates on the reader.